Hi, I'm Dawn Marie Soleil, and I'm with Innis 2022 Neurodiversity Conference, and I am here with Laura Kirby, Eliza Fricker, Harry Thompson, and we are talking about pathological demand avoidance, PDA for short. Um, we did a different video. If you haven't seen it yet, you need to go see that one. That's sort of the uh, entry level, what is PDA and, and some of the things involved there. This one, however, is a little bit more speaking to parents directly, um, but also folks that intersect with PDA individuals, whether it be physicians, educators, um, folks out there in the public, it's really important to understand what this is and how we can all cooperatively support, benefit, be involved with uh, individuals who, like myself, um, find part of our brain wiring uh, demand avoidance in certain situations. So all of you, thank you so much. I'm gonna let you introduce yourselves. Um, Harry, let's start with you. Just give us a little bit of an idea of who you are, why this topic is important to you and what you are doing about it. I don't know who I am. Identity is a continual struggle for us all. <laughs> like when I, when I emerged, from my mother's in 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 a tomb, they called me Harry, and I've been responding to it ever since. I I have struggles. With I, I, I wanted my name to be Bernard for a year. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I um, you know what? My name is Bernard. Okay, Bernard. I'll, I'll and I'll try to say it as as appropriately British as I can. Um, Bernard. Bernard, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> but I've struggled with names my whole life and I now understand that might be a little bit of my demand avoidance because I don't like that a name was put on somebody. It's so weird. There was that nine month period where we were just nameless and that was all right. Yeah, you, it, you were like the bean or something. I, right? missed, I missed my old house. It was really lovely. <laughs> Okay, so Harry, though you do professional stuff, really, to the pro benefit, really right. professional, serious to the benefit of PDA folks, to the benefit uh, of myself, of yourself. Okay, you all, you all happen to benefit from my selfish lifestyle. I love it. I agree. I agree. That's my world too. I love yeah. doing this stuff, which is why I do it. So yeah, but like words, you know, that's quite useful that we have we evolved the capacity to verbally communicate because if we didn't do that oh, i'd be unemployed i'd be a mess <laughs> so i make words with my mouth and people really like it and that's, that's what awesome I do. that's awesome i have so many people in my head right now that i am going to tell you have to watch this video let them out set them scary. free Right, Bernard, Bernard. Oh yeah, Bernard. I forgot about that. Um, yes, uh, so many people are going to really enjoy who you are and the way you respond to stuff. Um, but I'm going to let you just leave it there, and I'm going to move. This is why on. school is difficult because if people ask me normal questions, they get this like malarkey. <laughs> but it's so much more fun than the. I usual. know. I was trying to tell them that, and they pathologized it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many thoughts right now. Right, um, what do these parents want to know? I'm a busy man. Come on. Okay, well, they want to know about Laura, so I'm going to let Laura talk. Oh, yeah. Her. Forgot about her. She, <laughs> came, out, she came out of a womb as well. Thanks, Bernard. I, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm Laura. I'm lucky enough to be Harry Strait Bernard's business partner. I got worried about what you were going to say then. Yeah, that we'll go. We'll go with that. Yeah. So we are we are the co-founders of Nest, which is Neurodivergent Education Support and Training, which used to be known as Past Pathological. No, it wasn't. My God, I don't even know what my company's called. Positive Autism Support and Training. Um, prior to that, I worked in the education system here in the UK. So I was a head teacher at a specialist school. And before that, I worked in further education colleges. Um, and I also run or co-run an organisation called Kite, which provides what we refer to in the UK here as AOTAS, which is education other than at school. So we provide bespoke 
tutoring packages for children who are unable to access school or college and we've got about 50 children in our kite service and um i think 47 of them are autistic with a pda profile um and i have an adhd diagnosis and i have uh, two sons and my eldest son has also got an adhd diagnosis all right, very good. And you have a puppy in your lap, right? You have Not a puppy, puppy a cat. Oh, sorry, Kitty. Oh, all right. I misunderstood when I saw it. Well, coming. he does think he's a dog, so he'd probably be quite pleased that you thought he was a puppy. <laughs> you get down. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm I'm very happy when the pooches and the and the kitties join the join the party. Um, we had. Uh, I did a conversation with another individual and their their child was a regular participant of um, may I have toast and please fix the TV and all of those sorts of things. So yeah, the, the kitty is definitely welcome. Eliza, will you please uh, do whatever it is you want to do? <laughs> uh, my name is Eliza Fricker. I'm an author and illustrator. I write the blog Missing the Mark dot blog which is about uh, navigating the education system as well as autism i am also recently diagnosed autistic myself thank you um okay i just want to get something out of the way to begin with i love this topic and i hate what it's called pathological demand avoidance I try to bring this up with, with clients and I sort of warn them, you won't like what I'm going to call it. Try not to like want to hang up on me and fire me as soon as I say it. Because a number of my clients, as I talk to them, I start to get an indication that maybe this is a little bit of their wiring. And I say pathological demand avoidance and their pathological demand avoidance kicks in and they say no, right? It's, oh. not, it's not a nice name. I don't like it. It's a horrible name. For one thing, it makes us all sound kind of psychotic. Like we're, we're like yeah, pathological. Yeah. It just sounds like we're all gonna go eat the world. Um, so even though we've done this sort of PDA 101 uh, other video, I think probably we should start this one with a little bit of what is this thing that we're talking about? Well, we yeah. can call it the pervasive drive for autonomy instead, mm -hmm. can't we? Which has been used recently, which is really nice. Much nicer. Yeah. I love that pervasive drive for autonomy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I like that a lot. I like that. Another a lot. one there, isn't there? Similar to that. They're very similar. So, um, pervasive drive for autonomy was coined by PDA researcher Tomlin Wilding. And Around the same time, Dr. Wen Lawson, uh, autistic and PDA researcher and uh, a psychologist, coined persistent desire for autonomy. We don't know who got there first, but all we know is that these are uh, widely appreciated reframings of pathological demand avoidance. And we still get to keep the PDA because we're all rather attached to that bit. But I suppose, yeah, that is universal. I don't meet many people who like the term pathological um, for all sorts of reasons. In the autistic community, we don't want our experiences to be pathologized. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good reason. Um, and yeah, the other connotations surrounding pathology and illness and psychosis, as you said, um, psychopathy for others. Um, sometimes people endorse the word. The biggest irony is the person who came up with pervasive drive for autonomy said they didn't mind the word pathological because, and this is true on a literary note, um, pathological doesn't always uh, describe pathology or illness. There is a tertiary definition which suggests more pervasiveness, obsessive mm. extremity. Um, and I mean, even extreme demand avoidance is also employed by some clinics in the UK um, because of the problematic nature of pathological. But we need something to distinguish demand avoidance from PDA demand avoidance. Mm. Um, but no, it's a hellish word. 
Um, Laura, you mentioned that you and um, Harry or Bernard, um, <laughs> uh, you you organized Nest, and you help parents of PDA children. Is that correct? Yeah. So we um, we we set up Nest together at the, at the beginning of the year. Harry came up with the name. So a little bit of background. I was known as PAST, which was um, Positive Autism Support and Training. And um, in the new, sort of between Christmas and New Year, I got a little bit of kind of negativity on Facebook because of the name. People sort of were implying that it had links to ABA, which it absolutely doesn't, didn't. Um, but Harry contacted me and, and came up with this alternative name and, and then contacted me again and said, actually, I think we should do this together I really want to be a part of Nest and it's been it's been brilliant like since we've joined forces I think we've just we've done so much together we were doing a lot together anyway um but in terms it of it made sense didn't it that we it just made complete sense yeah and, and we work really well together um but we do we, we offer um one-to-one -one consults with parents which are usually online we offer um we, we run an assessment service so um harry does um pre-assessment screening and then i work with um a clinical psychologists we do um autism and demand avoidance assessments um but we also do um either live workshops like before covid harry and i were traveling all over the place doing live workshops but we also offer um webinars um online training online and then we've got loads of stuff that we've recorded as well which is on our website um but we don't just we i would say the majority of our clients come to us because of pda but we work with um all sorts of neurodivergence so autism adhd um you know we don't just work with pda but i think pda is probably making up about 90 percent of the families that contact us and um, we also go into schools and colleges and um train and, and work with the teachers as well which is just so important um because you know often the, the parents have had their light bulb moment and they're trying really really hard to adopt you know a, a really sort of pda friendly environment within the home and then that can be very badly undone when when children are being forced into schools where they just don't get it um and then what often happens i'm sure it's happening in the us as well is that um you know pda is a often fantastic maskers so they'll go into school and act like everything's absolutely fine um and then they'll come home well they might not even get home they might just get into the playground or into the car and then they just can't contain their anxiety their frustration um and you know they might start then physically or verbally you know attacking their parents or their siblings and it's very very common sadly for parents to then go into schools and sort of explain how much the child is, is suffering and the schools will say well, we don't see any of that they're absolutely fine when they're here and of course then that puts the the blame and the onus back on the parents so it's i think the work that harry and i do we we want to do a lot more in schools because it has to be joined up you know I've always said and actually Eliza's just done an, an illustration on this for the book that we're writing together um which has got a child sitting in the middle of a, of a triangle and then around the triangle it's got parents um professionals and, and school and, and everybody has to work kind of in a very equal triangle to to fully support that child's needs uh, yeah <laughs> that's a tough one and we'll come back to that um getting the buy-in from the other other spaces in your child's life um here in the united states even getting a child diagnosed there are so many hurdles and yeah. uh just for adhd or autism um as well as months long or years long waiting yeah. lists it's the same here it's the same here. i think um you know i know that we're, we're we probably are further ahead in terms of understanding of pda in the uk but it's still really poor i mean there's still a lot of local authorities that won't acknowledge it don't acknowledge it um i mean in the uk it's you, you still need the autism diagnosis to get the pda part um and there are still 
you know, very, I don't know what word can I use? There are still professionals that say, oh, they can't be autistic. They make really good eye contact, you know, like really, really kind of old fashioned way of thinking about autism. Um, so it's still very difficult here. It's still, it's not easy. Yeah. Eliza, um, can you maybe first tell us a little bit about how you got started writing your your um I, i'm not sure it's appropriate to call it a comic strip but you you do all of these these wonderful illustrations um and then you put many of them into your book um so yeah. how, how did that start please show us your book and tell us about it um uh so this is uh this actually is slightly different probably from my blog this is um but it's it's just all kind of supports and things that can really be helpful um, for families whose child is demand avoidant. Um, and then the blog is probably more, I would say, actual experiences of being in that system of education and trying to access support. Um, and really, the reason I sort of separate them out like that is because I started the blog really to help me process the experiences that we went through um, for eight years um, and to kind of help me make sense of it because that's my way of communicating is through drawing and writing um, and so it's really just about what we were talking about earlier when you're you've got a lot of your you've got a feeling and a sense quite a lot of the time but when you're butting up against different systems then you start to question yourself and those senses and and i suppose that's where eventually that leads to um you being quite unwell really you can become quite unwell as a as the carer or the parent um because you are ignoring what you you intrinsically know and sense and feel is right and and that's where the kind of hate set but that's where the madness lies really because you're going to meetings and, and you you know this is all wrong and this isn't the right support for your for your child but everyone you meet is telling you otherwise and and that's very very challenging at times the the interaction with education institutions um at, at any level uh i know for my I have three now adult children who um, are all neurodivergent and, and have uh, some measure of PDA impacting their, their way of thinking in their lives. Trying to advocate for them in school, especially because I didn't have appropriate language. I, I was unaware of my own neurodivergence, let alone theirs. Um, you know, Laura, we would have we would have been those people. Like we could make eye contact. We were highly verbal. Yeah. All of us got missed, um, and and all of the wrong labels flew at us. You know, my oldest was the problem child, and uh, my middle basically just got ignored. Too intelligent, too uh, too high grades, and then. In, almost incapable of doing homework, almost, or, you know, like it, it regularly got told, we don't understand, you're so smart, why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? You're so good, why aren't you, like just uh, what unfortunately was attempts to support this child uh, turned into just really toxic types of, of experience for the child. Um, being told they were good to, uh, sounded and felt like this incredible demand of never screw up, never do anything wrong, be perfect. Like somebody trying to tell this child growing up, you're doing a good job, you are intelligent, all of those things turned into um, a, a version of themselves that felt really burdened and unhappy. And then when the youngest, um, again not able to do homework and things like that but the youngest somehow was able to figure out for themselves kind of what was going wrong 
and would go to their school folks and say, hey, can I do it differently? Can mm -hmm. I, when I go home, I can't do homework, but as long as I stay in the school building, I can do homework. Don't make me go home. Let me stay here. And they wouldn't, or let me have, um, in the, in the United States, we call them study halls, these little periods during the regular school day where you can just do your homework. And they wouldn't allow her to have them because she was too smart. You know, those are not for, she literally had a person tell her, those are for stupid people. You may not have it. And she was horrified because many of her friends had study hall. Mm. <laughs> and she told this person, I don't care. I don't care what they're designed for. I need it mm. or I can't, I can't do my homework. And she was just told no. So how do you, how do you help? Education institutions, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, physicians, all of these people who are going to have an opinion about your child that may not match reality. How do you how do you invite them in and involve them in this process and help them open their minds to to this different type of thinking, this different way of interacting with the world? It depends how script that I sort of start with now where I just say oh um I, every everything here is child-led holistic um flexible and I, I've kind of reel it off so that anyone that luckily we don't have to meet too many people now but um it just gave them that they then they knew because I think sometimes you have to think that there are and I, I have spoken to a lot of different ed psychs and professionals and there's like loads of them are really, really good. You have to remember that they are also trapped by these systems that are decided by, you know, central government. So actually they go in there with, you know, the, a lot of them go in with the right, wanting to do the right, you know, the right thing. But, you know, when you've got these higher beings deciding how that's got to be, they're often as trapped as you are by these systems. But telling them in the beginning, how you do things at least lets them know very early on okay right they're one of those you know probably think oh right hippie family here or whatever but it just gives them that insight then and then they know early on how you do things because otherwise they're going to come out with the same old stuff because they don't know and they're going to you know bring all that stuff to you the visual timetable because you could be starting from scratch not you know whereas we can lead them a little bit and, and that's that's okay you know like Laura said earlier those collaborative approaches are so important you know and and you know I talk about all the time collaborative community connection but that's what you need to do is build up those things around you because that's how you're going to get the best for, for your family really. It depends on how cooperative and open they are as well does depend on that entirely i often when advising people i say well the first thing you have to do is bring all of this to the attention of the staff professionals etc um to gauge how uh flexible they're willing to be it's when they isn't that's the issue it's when they aren't that's the issue mm -hmm. and that's a tough one because perhaps taking the plunge and removing them from certain environments that are not going to work is the right course of action. But I don't necessarily think that that's the only idea, right? Um, it, it, it entirely depends upon the individual professional and how open they are to these ideas. And not only that, but what they are able to implement given their own limitations. But it's a it's a it's a tricky one. But I perhaps would point out that you and the child want the same thing. The child wants to be educated. You want to educate them, right? So again, it's the approach that matters. As in the last conversation when I spoke about, well, yeah, I want the same thing as the parent who's worried about the child's future. I want them to be thriving and flourishing and all the rest of it. It's the same within the school system. You want to teach. They want to learn. They do. They may not want to learn what you want, uh, what, what you want to teach them. Um, they may not be able to learn within the environment as it is now. Um, perhaps some sensory tweaks uh, need to happen. Um, and I always say, 
the teacher is first and foremost a student. They are the student of the child, their world, mm. uh, their capacity for learning, the point at which they become receptive to, to learning, right? I say that before you attempt to teach, see yourself as the learner. You are the student of the child right now. And there is a lot that you can learn by just stepping back and observing what inspires them, what interests them, right? Um, so I guess I would start there, but it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one for sure. One of the other things that I say to parents as well is that, um, you know, particularly sort of with, um, I don't know what your equivalent would be here in the US, but we have something called CAMS here, which is Child and Adolescent, and Adolescent Mental Health Service. And I would say to a parent, you know, don't walk in and say, I believe my child has PDA because that can instantly kind of put like a barrier up and a defense. I think it's much better to, whether you're talking to medical professionals or whether you're talking to schools, actually explain what PDA is, actually explain, you know, my child is autistic and they have this anxiety driven need to, to remain in control and avoid, that means they will avoid demands. So that that is a much more kind of, helpful way I think of describing it rather than saying oh it's it's PDA the other thing is as well is that um with with schools is that I think you know just try often you just get one one person in a school who can get who will get it and there's 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 two things that I say that every child needs in a school and um, one is a safe person who really understands them and the other is a safe place and I think if if you can find those two things within a school you know, sometimes it would be like the, the 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 janitor in the school. It doesn't even have to be a teacher. It just needs to. There just needs to be one person in that school that that child feels safe with. You know, I I work with a child who got, when we call them caretakers here, but he had this fantastic connection with the caretaker. And sometimes I'd go into school to see him. And they'd say, oh, he's out painting the fences with the caretaker at the moment. And I'd be like, that's fantastic, you know. So, it, the, the, you know, education, I wrote a post about this the other day. It, it's so, I'm sure it's the same in the US, but in the UK, our national curriculum is so restrictive. It is so restrictive and it's, you know, our national curriculum is restricted by buildings and it's restricted by this curriculum. And there are some schools that are, are doing a great job of sort of seeing beyond that. Um, and that's why I love AOTA so much, because we're not confined by anything. You know, I literally I work with two children who have AOTAS and I, I never know what we're going to do when I turn up. And that for me is so liberating as a teacher as well, just to turn up and just they want to talk about fish that fight with their penises. Brilliant. I'm happy to have that conversation, you know, and I, and I have done that. Um, they want to talk about Guy Fawkes and reenact it using all their teddy bears and they changed Guy Fawkes to Guy Fox, which is just genius. I'm there to do that. So I think it's um it's a mistake to believe that there are all of these limitations when it comes to interest uh, mm. learning. Because it's not like that at all. It's useful to see the interest as perhaps a vehicle. Um, I can remember an autistic kid I went to school with. His special interest was football, soccer, as you would um, erroneously call it. And his, geog his, ge his level of geography was incredible based on what he knew about individual players and where they came from. Um, I can, you know, e even most recently, right, uh, my, my interests never stray far from the psychological. And I've recently been very interested in psychopathy and serial killers and individual serial killers. And I end up absorbing the surrounding context of that individual, right? Because you can't help but make those associations and connections. So the interest really snowballs. It's not this kind of um, uniformly moving minute entity that doesn't really go anywhere, but uh, it's you know but but it's but within its own you know proximity no it branches out it's a rhizome it really really does move around and the learning process uh, accelerates 
it gathers momentum, it gets quicker, you cover more ground more quickly. Uh, and this is to alleviate any fears that parents may have when considering a more democratic and self um, led style of learning because, oh, but what if they don't end up learning about these really important things? It's like, no, you can more comprehensively than ever. Um, so yeah, there's, I do not view interest-based learning as limited in any sense of the word. It's not, it's quite the opposite. Mm. Um, and I always love speaking to my autistic and PDA adult friends about this. We are all radically unschooling ourselves and we don't even know it because a lot of us aren't in any kind of educational institution anymore, but le the learning doesn't stop. We all have our own interests that we freely pursue with passion and excitement and enthusiasm. So radical unschooling is the eventual outcome anyway. Why not just get rid of that tedious bit in childhood and just enjoy the ride? Mm. One thing I'll add to that as well, you won't have any of it unless you have that safety, like Laura was saying about that person, that safe person. Often in school, they'll say, I mean, they'll say this from a really young age as well about children. Well, they've just got to learn to be resilient. They've got to learn how to be independent. That is just absolutely nonsense because unless you've got a safe person to co-regulate with in that environment, then you've got nothing that that child does not feel safe and mm. so what we spend a lot of time doing when when that that environment can break down for children and they're no longer able to access it is we start on this kind of building block thing of building that safety up for them and that will start with just us and then letting other people in and that's why you know I think for like what Laura's work around the tuition I do this because it's parents might think well that's not really you know they're not really sitting at a desk are they learning but so much of what they they are gaining from that is that safety mm. and, and feeling really safe and connected with someone because unless you've got that you've got nothing no. No. Mm -hmm. one of the things that i i find in my own practice is that um pda can often come along with um oh my words just ran away from me give me a second um rejection sensitivity mm. um so that there's this sort of competing uh way the brain is working where we want our independence we want our autonomy um and that rejection sensitivity can can sort of ramp up the anxieties that, that can come with uh, demand avoidance um, because we there's so little about how we function that is validated and supported by the outside world. Mm. Um, you know, I I was. Uh, in many ways an exceptionally obedient child. So I don't know that anybody would have ever noticed my demand avoidance because my demand avoidance was, uh, it, it just it came Inver out. Inverted, in, inverted. Yeah, I would think it was inverted, but it also came out in, in ways that I felt I could survive. So yeah. one of my favorite yeah. stories from high school is, uh, an English teacher who came unprepared for class, which um, respect and cooperation with a with a teacher was imperative. <laughs> um, I really didn't want to cooperate with teachers who I didn't respect. I would because I have that you know like intense obedience thing. My my autism just operates that way. But came unprepared for for class. Looked out the window. It was snowing, and so she told us to write a poem about snow. I had no intentions of writing a poem about snow. So I wrote a poem about nuclear fallout in, in the language of snow, right? I got, an, I got a, a high mark and the only comment was disturbing, right? <laughs> my my uh, 
sensitivity to rejection and my demand avoidance sort of created this really odd world where it looked as though I was cooperative, mm. um, but I was finding my safest path through. And so when you talk about having that safe person or that safe space, um, you know, my, my oldest, uh, was very rebellious, very verbal, very, um, you know, so was, was viewed as obnoxious and uncooperative and all of those things. And so they got, they got really negative feedback about their behavior all the time, but they would always have one or two teachers that just fell in love with their brilliance. Mm -hmm. It was a really brilliant, intellectually capable, verbally capable person. And so like the history teachers and the English teachers tended to like them while the, the other teachers did not. And, but, the, but they didn't feel capable of advocating for this young person the way was necessary. So even though there were technically safe people, mm -hmm. There wasn't enough advocacy for the way they thought and the way they needed to interact with information and the fact that if anybody would have just gotten out of this individual's way, my my oldest's way, um, and and let them be interest driven. Half the reason why the science teachers and stuff didn't like them is because they'd come with more information than than that teacher had. Yeah. Been. You notice this, right? I remember when I started working closely with a lot of PDA kids and they would be brimming with this charisma and light and it would always be a case of, oh yeah, of course, of course the system hates you. You know, of course they hate your free spiritedness, your independence of mind and your original perspective and uh, your innovative streak and spark. It's like, of course, of course, a person like that is going to be pathologized. And it's 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 such a shame. Um, I can recall growing up. Not wondering how it was that I was going to. Get my work done and, you know, attend and behave properly, etc. But I remember having these weird moments of insight. And I remember one of them quite clearly was someone needs to show me how to. Tame the untamable beast within. Because I can remember feeling like there's so much happening that's just not harnessed or not controlled. And everything I'm being asked to attend to has no relevance whatsoever. It has no bearing on this. I had this sense of this almost conceited sense that I can do the academic stuff on my own in my own time. Right. At my own pace. But can someone please show me how to rein in? this intensity you know and i couldn't really dis i couldn't really even even speaking about it now sounds vague right but if I, I speak about it to my close pda friends and they get what i mean they say yeah god this is a responsibility here right this can spill out there are certain things i have come to realize i have to steer clear of there, there are certain things that i have to do which sounds bizarre but i often talk about um there is i have to do that and within that sense, I'm separated from the obligation. And there is, I'm going to do that. You know, you can get to that place where you are riding the obligation, right? I, I talk about this sense of, I can only become, I can't do. Mm -hmm. Doing is impossible because do means that I'm separate from that which needs to be done. But when I'm doing, I'm actually becoming, right? So there's this sense of I'm riding the obligation and yeah, there are there are sacrifices. There's 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 an intensity that I felt that I couldn't control that would unveil itself and unleash itself in really kind of messed up ways a lot of the time, you know. Um, but I wanted people to show me how to tame and harness that growing up. I thought just the school stuff. Who cares? I've got that covered. I need I need another lesson somehow. But the person who could mentor me and teach me. Uh, would so seldom come, you know, mm. and occasionally, yeah, I'd meet someone and it would, it would work, it would work. I'm like, yes, okay, cool. You're showing me something that no one else has worked out yet, you know. Laura, in, in the work that you do, do you find that, um, 
you know, we've talked about anxiety coming along with PDA, but does a, a general sadness or even depression tend to come along? You know, I listen to, to Harry talk and I think about my oldest and, and the amount of um, really deep sadness and anger that was felt because they just, they were not understood. And this incredible desire to be understood and to be validated as the person that they were and just not finding it out there in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I do see that, um, particularly um, when children come to us, to us for an assessment because they haven't been diagnosed as PDA. So they're the ones that are, I think are really, really struggling still. Um, you know, I, and I always think about this child that came to see us recently who'd kind of struggled in primary school um, and then he'd transitioned to secondary school, which I think you would just call high school. And his life kind of imploded, you know, he wasn't able to go to school anymore. He he was so, he didn't understand the injustice of school. You know, he was saying things to me like, I don't understand how teachers can shout at me, but if I raise my voice back, I get into so much trouble. I don't understand why teachers get to sit on comfortable chairs and I have to sit on a hard plastic one. He couldn't, he just couldn't cope at all. And because he wasn't going into school, he like lost his social, um, his peer group. And I, and I did see a real sadness within him. But I also see the other side of it. And, and because I work with children who who are diagnosed and who have AOTAS and are having these amazing um, opportunities working with people who that really get them and really get PDA and their parents really get them in PDA, I see children that are just absolutely thriving. Um, so I think it it depends, you know, the children that I work with, it very much depends where they are kind of on their on their journey. Um, and but, I would say that's the bit that kind of can sometimes get mixed up where sometimes the adults around a PDA child can assume almost that they're okay just being left because of the autonomy element that they're just leaving them and I think that that's when you can see sometimes when I speak to families and they'll say that the child is just on their own in their room all day mm. and I think that obviously for a lot of children they will have a kind of burnout or even a breakdown after their experiences in school so that will appear to you know they will be very low and be in their bedroom for for a period of time I don't I don't think they want to stay in their bedroom no that that's where the input requires a lot from the adults around that child constantly checking in constantly offering stuff constantly being available even if that's you know when you see the they're more energized at 10 o'clock being available at 10 o'clock without a sigh or a begrudging thing if they want to make a cake because you've just got to be available on their schedule um because i think that sometimes that isolation for those children is not something you have to think for most children they don't want to live in their bedroom just because they you know it's the same as when people would say our child that sat in the corridor all day at school because the classroom was too overwhelming or maybe they're happier out there because they're autistic but no one's happy really to be completely isolated with no input or stimulation <laughs> so i think that that's something that's sometimes misconstrued and i think that's where we have to think creatively all the time about how we input to that yeah, and I, I always say to, to, to um, sort of people who work in education, and Harry, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but you have to become like a learning facilitator. You just have to be there to, I mean, again, Elijah and I, um, we've got an illustration of this of the book. We've got a, a market stall with all different kinds of, you know, like all these different market stalls. And like when you go to a market, you pick things up, you put them down, you browse, there's no pressure to buy. You just kind of, you find someone that picks your, takes your fancy and then you pick it up and you might take it you might not that's how education should be but actually as a parent you've just got to be there to facilitate as well and I think a lot of the children that, that we work with they 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 often do have autistic burnout because the system has been so 
horrendously damaging to them and they might retreat to their prison but again another analogy that Eliza and I have, have written about and Eliza drew was a, a tortoise you know a tortoise will pop its head out of a shell and have a little look around and if it's if it feels safe it will stay out but if it feels scared it will retreat back in again so again as a parent you've got to be there to sort of just facilitate and, and I know we mentioned this in the other video but connection is so 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 important um i had a consult with a, a a really nice dad last week and you know you know he he came to me you know feeling a bit down because he'd been gaming with his son and his he wasn't very good at gaming and the son was calling him you know the kind of most abusive word that you can or the most offensive word offensive um and i think he thought i was going to say oh that's terrible i said that's fantastic that you're gaming with him you know fan, well done that is what you should be doing and yeah you aren't very good at it at the moment but you are you are trying to build that connection and you will get better and I think we just have to find those little things like Eliza said if it's baking a cake at 10 o'clock at night then you won't have to be baking a cake every night at 10 o'clock but by baking a cake at 10 o'clock you're you're showing that child I'm really really here for you and then the next you know a week later it might be eight o'clock or whatever do you know what I mean it's not going to be forever but like forging those really trusting connections whether it's as a parent as a professional it, it is just a hundred percent the most important thing that you can do that's amazing um gosh I want to keep I could talk to all of you forever um but we are coming up on our, our time limit um is there a thing that maybe each of you could think if if somebody's just starting on this journey with their child, uh, whether they're maybe after listening to this, they think, oh, maybe that's what my child is dealing with, or maybe that's what I'm dealing with. Um, something that might get them started in a direction. Um, you know, obviously they can reach out to all of you and those sorts of things, but what do I implement in my own life as maybe step one if if I want to start doing a better job supporting my PDA child? Uh, Harry, you're, you're muted, I think. Um, I think a period of de-schooling and deconditioning has to take place first and yeah. foremost, right? Because yeah how we are conditioned to believe what parenting and teaching children entails um is exists in stark contrast to teaching and parenting the pda way so as m we need to lessen the internal conflict and paradoxes as much as possible really throw out the uh the, the master's tools as it were and create a new set that has to take place first and foremost in my mind before people as i said before people want to know and they want to know in a very un-pda way right so people who follow me on social media will know that my biggest bugbear is the question how do i get my child to mm. x right and i say no, no no you need to lose your conditioning first you need to completely de-school and throw out everything you know before you start again and see your child as instrumental in the process and in, in that right they are showing you every meltdown every expression of emotional distress is your teacher they are showing you what works and what doesn't work by just expressing thank you that's great eliza or laura um i think i think what one of the things if you're sort of questioning this and thinking this seems extremely radical i i will say that you will have a connection more of a connection than you've ever had before because what you'll have got you will have got to a point and there will be massive disconnect with you parenting the other way mm. um, i know there's many other ways within that but you can honestly you can have a much much happier household when you do rip that rule book up and it is okay to look back at your own history how you were brought up and what you thought you should do and say well actually was that okay and does it matter if we do it another way mm. um, and you will see the reward in 
you won't have those meltdowns and you won't have those difficulties and you will have that genuine connection which you will have had that disconnect um before and you will actually get to understand and and see your child um and it will be a happier place for it laura any last words yeah i just think i mean eliza just alluded to this but i would just you know pick your battles ask yourself does it actually really matter if you know does it matter if my child's got their ipad at the breakfast table does it matter if they don't want to take a coat to the park you know you know you're never going to put your child in a, in a position where they're in danger but i think we enforce so many arbitrary rules like manners and sitting at the table and all these things and actually ask yourself why am i asking for this to be done and and actually you know remove being able to sort of just say i'm, I'm not going to worry about those things anymore will make your child so much happier but it will also make you so much happier as a parent as well well thank you all so much um i i i do believe that parents are going to hear your words and and feel a sense of comfort and maybe maybe a path forward um i'll make sure that all of your social media and websites and all of those things are linked with this video so that people can follow you and reach out to you um thank you thank you for bringing your stories and your hearts and your passions uh to ns 2022 um i know it's going to go do good stuff thank you for thank having you. us all righty bye bye everybody